You're watching KOCT's North County Roundtable. Hello, my name is Kent Davey. Together with my co-host, Allison St. John, we'd like to welcome you to the new North County Roundtable. With this CAMCAST, we intend to bring to our North County viewers news and opinion makers in hopes of aiding discussions of important public issues. It's a format somewhat different than the old journalist Roundtable show. I was the editor of the now shuttered North County Times for 16 years and now teach as an adjunct professor at Cal State University San Marcos. Allison worked for KPBS Public Broadcasting in San Diego for 29 years as a reporter, anchor, and host. She retired earlier this year, but is still contributing to KPBS and keeping an eye on North County. Allison? Well, Kent, I'm so happy to be here. And um, the reason that we decided to make this homelessness the topic of this first CAMCAST is because homelessness has really become the hot political topic, not just in San Diego, but around California. There was a time, I remember, when we used to cover homelessness just at winter time, you know, with the winter shelters. And now, of course, we all know it's become a year-round problem. So there are some statistics that we thought we should uh, let you have right at the top of the show. The Regional Task Force on the Homeless has done a, a, an annual count. They do an annual count every spring. And uh, this January, the volunteers went round and they counted 1,570 homeless people in North County. Now that is about almost 800 people in inland North County and almost 800 people in coastal North County. And that amounts to about 20% of all the homeless in San Diego County. Here in Oceanside, there's almost 400 homeless people were counted. And of course, we can pretty much assume that that count is likely to be an underestimation because a lot of the homeless are not visible and didn't even make the count. So it's a big problem, and we really look forward to talking about it tonight. Right. To help us understand the problem and the possible solutions, uh, we've asked Greg Engel, Executive Director of Interfaith Community Service, to join us. Later on in the show, we'll have Oceanside Homeless Ad Hoc Committee Chairperson, Michelle Gomez. First, let's welcome Greg Angel to our show. In the early 2000s, my colleagues and I launched uh, a coverage to uh, try and understand the intractable problem of homelessness in our, our communities. Back then, we reported that North County had about 700 homeless. Now, the number seems to have more than be double, according to the numbers Allison just gave us. What do we do? What can we do? It's tempting to look at homelessness as a systemic societal issue and try to therefore address it as a systemic societal uh -huh. issue. But in our experience, homelessness can only be addressed on a person by person basis. And in our experience, regardless of somebody's situation, homelessness is solvable for every individual. It may take a lot of work, it may take uh, many months and sometimes years, but for every individual, they can overcome homelessness. Um, so on a personal basis, it's a totally solvable issue. Do you divide up the problem between what's short-term solutions and long-term solutions? After all, it's one thing to simply say, I'm going to get you off the street, out of the rain, uh, someplace warm, give you a meal, so on. And that different problem altogether to say, I'm going to try and figure out how to get you in some sort of permanent housing. Yeah. Every situation is different, right? So we actually started a podcast called Homeless in San Diego. It's an interview show um, that the listeners here can, can check out on any podcast listening device. We did that because we got tired of the stereotypes around homelessness. Oh, they're all mentally ill. They're all addicted. They're, mm -hmm. they're maybe lazy. All these things that um, for some individuals is, are perhaps true. But, but for the 1,500 people who were counted last year... Um, Every there are fifteen hundred personal stories. Right, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about who these folk are, because you know it's not just single men, it's not just vets, but I mean, who are the homeless now in North County? Sure. So one of the ladies who we're working with right now, um, she's in her seventies, and she became homeless uh, when her husband of forty years passed away this last year, and with uh, his death, uh, she lost the income that was paying the rent. And she couldn't afford that rent. She fell into homelessness. And when we found her um, and engaged her through uh, our homeless outreach team in partnership with the city here in Oceanside, she actually had come down with pneumonia from living on the streets. Mm -hmm. And there was a time when she was actually placed on hospice care. Um, 
We've gotten her into what we call a, a bridge housing uh, program, a short-term housing program, while we try to find her an apartment for her to live in. Um, her health has improved, and um, she's a whole different person. That's just one story, uh, but it's an example of all the things in the life that can happen to lead to somebody becoming homeless. Well, I know that in the past you've said that um, the causes of homelessness were um, perhaps the fault of the, the person in the old days because there were enough houses. Um, how would you say that the causes of homelessness have really expanded now? Uh, and, and people, you know, the, the woman just down the road from me, I was shocked the other month to see that she was being evicted. So it can happen so much more commonly to people now, can't it? Yeah, sure. And people make bad decisions that can lead to poverty and lead to homelessness. Um, I've made lots of bad decisions, but I have um, a family and a support network that has helped me overcome those those challenges in my life, right? Um, not everyone has that support system. And a lot of people who we find on the streets just didn't have anyone when they were in that time of crisis. Um, I was buying uh, some uh, cold medicine a couple weeks ago and I uh, had my interfaith community services name badge on and the lady at the checkout counter said um, oh you work at interfaith mm -hmm. and, and she said it in a way there's a, there's a different way people say it when they're like oh yeah I like interfaith and there's a when interfaith has helped them or a loved one it's very different and she said it in just that way and she said last year I was getting a divorce and um, I was about to lose my housing because of, of what was happening through that divorce and, and, and Interfaith helped me find an apartment um, and then when we moved into that apartment with the little bit of first and last month's rent that you provided, you furnished it for me and my three children. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if, if Interfaith or other organizations weren't there for her in that situation, she could have been on the streets and who knows what, have, what would have happened to those kids. So every situation is different. The reason I brought that up is um, everyone, a lot more people are closer to homelessness as the cost of housing has increased. Right, right, yeah. Do, does Interfaith or any of the other agencies, uh, as they um, interact with people one-on-one, -on -one, and I understand why every case is different, do they collect the information and data to be able to sort out over a t period of time to un try and understand on a more systemic or more meta basis what the drivers are right now. For example, in 2008 and nine, when we had the big recession, I know just from having worked at the, at the Interfelt Shelter Network, um, pe most of the people in the network that, that uh, I happened to inter uh, interact with, they, they were economic cases. Um, different matter altogether when I participated in the We Count uh, down in Encinitas, most of the people there, they look like probably they are chronic, probably maybe mentally ill, maybe drug abusers. You know, a really different sub subset of the of the people. And I'm curious how much you guys know actually know about what you what you're dealing with. We know a lot. We work with a system of coordinated uh, shelters in North County through a group called the Alliance for Regional Solutions mm -hmm. that brings together nonprofits in North County cities. Those shelters uh, served more than 1,100 men, women, and children last year. Mm -hmm. And we know that half of those, the adults, came in with an income. Um, and about half of those with income had jobs. The other half were, were disabled and bringing down disability benefits. Um, about 40% of those individuals had disabling conditions. Um, so we have really specific data on, on those people who are trying to overcome homelessness through shelter mm -hmm. and uh, the number one cause of why they became homelessness for all of those individuals was economic. How about the other 600, 700 that are beyond the, the, the 1,100 served though? You've got another, you've got another big population that are still out on the street. What do we know about them? So we know that homelessness is really bad for your health and we know that somebody without housing on average will die 30 years before their housed counterpart. And um, homelessness and mental health are often conflated. Mm -hmm. What we have from similar data points is that uh, in one year about 3,000 people in North County encountered a, a homeless program trying to overcome homelessness. We know this through the Regional Task Force on the Homeless. So 3,000 people, we have good data on that. 3,000 individuals. Individuals, yeah. Okay. That's just North uh, County. Uh, do you know how many of them are struggling with mental health problems? Sure. So we do. 
actually report a mental health condition of now, some that sort. that is so interesting. So you might say, wow, well, mental health causes homelessness, well, right? Well, more 90%. that we should be providing more mental health services. Well, well, yes, wouldn't that be mental but, health correlates? But see, if you ask the follow-up question, is that mental health condition preventing you from being housed? Did it cause your homelessness? The number drops to 10%. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Correlates does it cause. The reality is homelessness causes mental health conditions. Okay. Now, there are individuals who become homeless because of untreated mental health conditions, sure, but, but, but homelessness is bad for your health, and that just deteriorates the longer somebody's in that situation. Okay. I know the, the federal government adopted the Housing First uh, uh, policy strategy, I don't know, 10 years ago, more than that, 15 yeah. years ago yeah. or so. Does, on a national scale, has anybody done the, the sociological data um, studies to to try and understand whether or not that strategy as opposed to any other strategy works. Absolutely. So the target population where the Housing First strategy has been resourced the most, funded the most, is around veterans. Mm -hmm. We've actually seen a more than 50% decline in veterans experiencing homelessness over that 10-year period. Which shows that when you do really apply pro programs and policies, it does work. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But it, but that means perhaps that I, I've talked to some people providing homeless services who feel like too many resources have gone to that one section of the population and families, for example, are not getting the same amount of help. It, it takes, it takes all, all aspects. The, uh, we've got basically 30 seconds to sure. kind of wrap up, Greg. Does, is, is there enough variety in the kind of service programs that are available here in North County? Where, or do we still have big holes? We have critical gaps with shelter. There are 144 year-round shelter beds in North County. They are all full. There are people who want to get off the streets, want to get into shelter. There are none available. There are more than 2,000 in the city of San Diego. It's a critical gap. We also need, for families that you mentioned, oh. um, Allison, we need homeless prevention funds to prevent them from becoming homeless. And then when they become homeless, there are very few family homeless shelters and also very few places for those in cars to be able to, to park. So we need more family shelters and then help to get them out of those shelters and into housing, short-term uh, rental assistance. One thing we haven't talked about is the fact that even when you've found somebody a house, that doesn't mean to say they're going to be able to continue to pay the rent. So how do you help them stay in that house? I think that's also a, a key issue which we'll have to talk about another time. <laughs> Thank you, Greg, for appearing on our show tonight. Viewers interested in what Greg has talked about should go visit his podcast, homelessinsandiego.org. We'll be back in just a minute with more North County Roundtable right after this. Welcome back to KOCT's North County Roundtable. I'm Alison St. John along with Kent Davey and we are talking about homelessness on this episode. Uh, our next guest is Michelle Gomez who is the chairperson of the ad hoc committee set up by the Housing Commission, Oceanside Housing Commission, to study homelessness. So Michelle, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. So now I understand that the, the city council, the city staff in Oceanside have recently produced a report which is to guide the city on how to attack homelessness. Um, 
as the chair of the ad hoc committee, do you feel like this report is really covering all the bases? I feel like they've done a great job on the report, and I think they're really focusing on a lot of the areas that are just uh, really crucial to Oceanside. You know, where we've advanced our hot team, we're really em emphasizing the work that they're doing. We've added social workers to the hot team, we're putting a second hot team in place. All of that is really great work, and we're out in the community doing a lot of good things for our homeless population. The downfall I see with that hot team is that they're only Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. And we all know that homeless issues aren't Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. But I believe that the city has done a great job in putting that plan together. We also have Neighborhood Services that is doing a great, great work with affordable housing and different programs as well. Didn't the state just give Oceanside a couple of hundred thousand dollars um, to deal with homelessness? And, and, and as a result, I believe we have some more staff on the hot team. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. So we've put a, net, a second hot team in place. We had one with two officers and a social worker. We're now putting another one in place, and we're also getting another van. The, the, the national uh, discussion about homelessness has uh, really raged about the problems in San Francisco and Los Angeles and some other big cities like that. Um, is it correct for us to assume that we, our problems aren't, aren't like that? We don't really have that kind of problem that, that the people are getting themselves so wound up about, I'd say about Los Angeles, that the scale of our problem is so much different that, that, it's, that there isn't any reason to get quite that excited. Well, I think the first thing that's important to recognize and understand is that California is number one in homelessness in the United States. So that's across the board. Now, we definitely have a, you know, less of a problem here in San Diego County, especially in Oceanside, than we do in, let's say, Los Angeles or San Francisco. But it's still an issue that impacts quality of life for all of our residents, and so it needs to be treated the same. We don't have the same volume, but it's still impactful. Do you have any sense in the, the data that you guys have collected or you guys have available to study what's happened to th this tier of people over, over some time period? Well, our homeless numbers have gone down in the last two years. In the last two years in Oceanside itself, we've seen a decline of about 185 people. Okay. So we are doing some things right. The problem that I see is that we don't have enough data to study. We don't have the auditing in, in process. We don't have the metrics in place. And I think that's the crucial missing piece here in really addressing the, the concerns that we have. The city of Oceanside puts a lot of money and resources into the homeless issue. However, we don't know where those funds could best be utilized because we don't have the metrics in place. If you, if you were to just go by your intuition of what you know about the problem, where would you guess the best spot to add you know, the, the marginal dollar would be? Well, I don't think that we need to add any additional funding. I think we need to look at what we're spending money on and really analyze that before we put any more money into the problem. And I think that what we really need to focus on is prevention. If we can prevent someone bec before they come become homeless, before they're on the streets, we're going to have a much better chance at keeping them housed. Once they're on the streets, we have a much more difficult time in getting them back into housing, and it costs us that much more money. So I think that the biggest thing that we should focus on is uh, seniors. Seniors are the fastest growing homeless population, especially here in Oceanside. We're seeing a lot of people that are concerned about rent control and the mobile home parks that are being pushed into the streets. We also have a huge homeless youth problem, and there are ways that we can address that. We can look at Miracosta College for safe parking spaces, mm -hmm. and there are things that we should be doing that we're not doing, and that won't cost us necessarily a lot of money. It's reallocating funds. Do we, do we, do we have much data about the individual cases here in Oceanside? We do not. So uh, that, that is obviously something that Oceanside is going to have to work on. I mean, I know that the, the most successful thing that Oceanside perhaps can claim credit for recently is opening the affordable housing units at Mission Cove, where you've got hundreds of extra affordable housing units, and many of them are for seniors specifically. Isn't that right? But m one of my concerns is that I, I think it looks good to be providing affordable housing, but when you look at the statistics that are given to uh, SANDAG, to the regional um, body from Oceanside, the, the number of houses that are being lost from the affordable housing stock is higher than the number of houses, affordable houses, that are being added. Right. Do you see that as something that anyone is really focusing on? 
I don't see that as something that anybody's really focusing on. And what I would propose that we do is that we really crack down on developers in the city of Oceanside. We really focus on insisting that we put affordable housing units into every development project. Right now, we are basically giving away the keys to the city, and we need to be tough on development, tough on developers, and insist that we have affordable housing units in any development that goes into our city. I'm not proposing that we throw up a bunch of develop, uh, development that's really just focusing on homelessness and low income, because we don't want to segregate. But mm -hmm. I think that we should have affordable homes in every single development, at least a fraction. Some of the communities near us are talking about uh, expanding granny, basically granny flat kind of units as a way to, to bolster the housing stock generally under the theory that if you bolster housing stock generally, you're going to have more units, presumably um, it'll, I suppose, trickle down I say, to, uh, to lower income. Uh, is that something that is possible here? Absolutely. I think the Granny Flat uh, suggestion is a great one. However, I think that the city is going to have to put ordinances in place to ensure that those Granny Flats don't ultimately become short-term rentals rather than dealing with our homeless issue and our low-income issue. Do you have any uh, sense uh, of how many housing units we need? Is, is there a deficit number that we can point at and say, That's, this is really what we got to do? The point in time count hasn't come out for this year yet that I've seen those hard numbers. But we're looking at probably about 485 homeless individuals in the city of Oceanside at last year's count. So we need to be able to provide beds for each and every one of them. So we're looking at at least 500 beds. How many beds do we have now? Any idea? Uh, you know what? I don't know. I'm okay. sorry. But once the beds now are being seen as bridge housing, right? It's not like you expect a homeless person to remain in, in a homeless shelter bed. The, the goal would be to get them into a house, isn't that right? Or get them into some kind of, of shelter that is, is or not a shelter, a home. Where Absolutely. they can actually start housing. to live their lives. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So we're looking at shelters as being bridge housing. We need to get permanent solutions in place, which goes back to developers and developing affordable very extreme low income housing. We have affordable housing in the city, but we don't have that extreme low and that very low and that low. Doesn't that create a, a, an interesting problem though? I know I read in uh, the Los Angeles Magazine that you know, they had passed a huge bond issue there to, to build affordable housing units. They started out assuming that uh, uh, at the beginning, I think it was the beginning of 19, that they would be $300,000 a unit. And now they're predicting it'll be $500,000 a unit, which makes it close to the median house price here in, in uh, uh, North County. Absolutely. And so I think it's critically important, like I said, that we get tough on developers. We need to insist that they don't um, have in lieu fees. Right now we have developers that will pay in lieu fees to uh, not have to develop the affordable housing. That's problematic for us. And if we can reduce some of the red tape, you know, countywide, statewide, I think that would incentivize builders to build at that lower income level. Mm. Right now they're not incentivized, they're finding the loopholes. We need to close those loopholes. Is, does Ocean, Oceanside sit on a fairly large pot of money that has come for the in lieu of developer fees? No, it's not a lot of money, uh, it's just a loophole. So they can pay very little to get out of that requirement. Okay. Until recently, I think Oceanside's um, um, the fees that a developer could pay to get out of that were, were some of the lowest in the county, oh, but um, right. I believe there is some pressure to try to raise that. But like Kent says, the amount of money it costs to build affordable housing, it's very daunting to see that you would ever be able to build enough affordable housing. I just wanted to ask you, there's, um, you know, for people living in Oceanside, there's a very obvious problem, even if you just go down to the pier, um, just downtown, there's uh, an increasing number of people who obviously are homeless. And I wanted to know, what is the policy? What is the hot team? Uh, what is their goal? Uh, do, do they have a remit? Do they have instructions as to what to do? I mean, they, these people are certainly allowed to be wherever they are. It's, there's no crime to being on the street. So, so what does the hot team do? The hot team is really responsible for interaction with our homeless community and helping them to find shelter beds, helping them to get into services. That's their primary function. They also have social workers that work with them that will help with any kind of uh, substance abuse or mental illness or any of those types of issues. Now, there was a recent court case that came out of the Ninth Circuit that basically says that we can't criminalize homelessness right. and we cannot tell people that they can't sleep in, the pub in public areas. With that court case, we the only way we're going to get those people off the streets is to provide those shelter beds. So we need to have a one-one ratio. 
And do you feel like there's enough um, mental health services as well? We, we all know that Tri-City, you know, closed down right. its psychiatric unit and the county is talking about opening something more. But as, um, you know, the chairperson of the Ad Hoc Committee on Homelessness, do you feel like North County is dealing with mental health issues enough? I don't believe the state of California is dealing with mental health issues enough, and, and I don't think Oceanside is either. With Tri-City Hospital, we have people that are going, that are homeless people that are going into Tri-City for mental health issues. They're then getting released back into Oceanside. We need to really be working with our neighboring cities to find solutions to these situations. There's nothing that prevents uh, or that requires us to have any kind of services in place once we release, release somebody from Tri-City back into our streets. And I think it's really critically important that we're working with our city of Carlsbad, Encinitas, Escondido, San Marcos, and really working together on regional solutions to provide uh, beds and housing. Right. Do, do you think that um, if, you, if you had the ability to say that, to change one thing in the way we do something now, is there a single thing that you would think would make a significant difference quickly? I think we need the metrics and we need the auditing. I, I really, like I said prior, I don't think that we need to be spending more money. I think we need to know where that money is being spent and how it's really being used and benefiting. Right now, we don't have those metrics in place, and those metrics are crucial. What would it do to? What would it take to do that? Well, we can't go back. So I think right. it's something that we need to start doing now. We really need to emphasize on putting those those metrics in place. So are you guys going to devise a recommendation of saying, okay, here's a protocol for anybody from the hot team, anybody showing up, uh, I don't know, at the intake of, of uh, say, a, a shelter or something like that? This is the kind of stuff, data that we need then? Absolutely, and I think that's important, and that's going to be one of the recommendations that comes out of the ad hoc committee that will go to the Housing Commission is that we need to make sure that the hot team has metrics, that uh, neighborhood services has metrics, that the city council has metrics, because that data is going to help us figure out the best way to address these issues. Without data, we're flying. We're just sure. flying in the wind. We don't sure. have anything to measure against. Yeah. One of the other things that I think is crucially important is that we really address our youth homelessness. Because if we have youth homeless, we're setting them up for a life of homelessness, which also feeds into our overall pro problem and program. Mm -hmm. I'd also really like to see, and I know a lot of services go towards our veterans, but I'd like to see us really focus on uh, you know, eradicating veterans' homelessness, especially here in the city of Oceanside with our proximity to the base. But we don't really know at this point, do we, or do, maybe we do, do we know what kind of split we have between the various categories of homelessness, like of the 400 plus homeless that we have uh, on the week count, how many might be veterans approximately, how many might be families with children, how many might be, I don't know, uh, chronic homeless because they're mentally ill or something else. Any of those kind of categories? Do we know anything like that? We do. We do have that data from the last point in time count. I haven't seen the recent numbers for 2019, but about 10 to 12 percent were veterans that were homeless in the city of Oceanside last year. Okay. And I know veterans are, are one of the groups that had that um, Oceanside and many other communities have had more success um, getting them off the streets, partly because there has been so much federal focus on that and a lot of federal money coming down the pike. I'm surprised, frankly, that you're saying we don't need more money because it seems like um, with more money you would be able to subsidize people's rents, for example. Um, don't you feel like some more of the money that's coming down from the state right now, for example, would help Oceanside to, to help people off the streets? Absolutely. I think that more state funding would help us with you know, re reducing rent costs. Absolutely. But I'm saying that I don't believe the city of Oceanside should put any more money into the problem until we can really see where we're benefiting and where those dollars are being best utilized. The state funding would be absolutely crucial and beneficial because the rising cost of rents and the low vacancy is really a problem here in Oceanside. Well, thank you very much, Michelle, for joining us tonight and talking about this. Uh, I'd like to have you back sometime to find out how you've done with the metrics uh, later. Absolutely. The Housing Commission Ad Hoc Committee is looking at having our recommendations to the Housing Commission, which would then get ratified and sent to the Council probably second quarter. Excellent. We'd like to thank both of our guests, Greg Angel and Michelle Gomez, for joining us on this edition of North County Roundtable. If you have comments or suggestions, please forward them to info at koct.org. KOCT is available in Oceanside on Cox Communication Channels 18 and 19 
and on AT&T's UVerse service countywide. This program will also be made available as video on demand via KOCT.org. Thank you for watching KOCT, the voice of North County. Thank you.